Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the podcast, I'm going to be telling you about what pilots actually do in cruise. Does it ever get boring and are there subjects that we're not allowed to talk about? Stay tuned. Wind 31016, right, right. Right. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, you have been sitting in the hammock or lying by the pool now for the last two months or so. I certainly have. And I just had to get back to work. And using a tool like Brilliant would have definitely got my gears working a little bit better. They do things like daily challenges in mathematics and physics. They will show you how to solve those challenges if they're getting a little bit too hard. And uh, the 501st of you who uses this link here below will get a whopping 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant. But as always, it's completely free to go and check it out. So use the link, try it. Right guys, so today we're gonna to be talking about what pilots actually do when we're in the cruise, all right? And the cruise phase is what comes after the climb and before we start the descent. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide this into five different areas. And the first area we will talk about is what we are actually paid to do, all right? What we're supposed to do, what our jobs are. So once we have finished the sterile phase of flight, which is from when we push back until we reach our top of climb, which is our cruising altitude. When we're done with that, uh, the roles are divided into two different roles. Okay, We have the pilot flying role and the pilot monitoring role. So the pilot flying is, just like the name suggests, flying the aircraft. Um, the pilot flying will be uh, making sure that we have the right autopilot modes in, that the aircraft is on the right track, uh, that it properly trimmed so it's not kind of displaced the uh, yoke in one direction or the other, and making sure that when we get shortcuts and things like that, that the aircraft is flying the correct way. Okay, so in the cruise, since the autopilot is engaged, it's not that high workload. But eventually, once we get a little bit closer to our destination, the pilot flying is the one who is going to set up and brief for the approach. And that will take, depending on how complex the arrival route is and how complex the arrival airport is, might take about 15-20 minutes to do. Um, obviously, on a long flight, it means that there are some time to do some other stuff, which we'll get to very soon. Now, the pilot monitoring uh, generally has a little bit more to do during the cruise phase than the pilot flying. And that's because the pilot monitoring is responsible for communicating with air traffic control and doing the paperwork that needs to be done. And what kind of paperwork is that? Well, first of all, I have to say at this point that there is a difference between if you fly for a short to medium air, uh, haul airline or a long haul airline. So what I'll be talking about is what I do, which is short to medium haul. Um, when we're in the crew room, we get issued with a flight plan. Okay, The flight plan is describing uh, the route that the aircraft is going to fly. It's calculated the times it will take between each waypoint along the, uh, the route, how much fuel it's supposed to burn, what the winds are like, what the uh, turbulence is supposed to be like, if there is any, and things like that. So this means that once we get up into the cruise phase, the pilot monitoring will take the paperwork up and we'll start to fill in all of the different things to make sure that what the company planned for us to do, which is the flight plan, actually corresponds to what the aircraft is doing. Because there might be things like differences in wind speed, there might be sudden reroutings by air traffic control because of military restrictions and things like that. So it's really, really important that pilot monitoring calculates exactly what we're doing and does fuel checks and time checks about every 30 minutes during flight. So that's uh, what the pilot monitoring will be doing. Um, we're doing that by hand. Now it's likely to be changed to into electronic format soon. But we calculate it down. Once it's all calculated, that's the, the uh, timings and the fuel and all of that that I just mentioned, the pilot monitoring will be giving a brief to the pilot flying saying that, okay, this is what was planned to be happening. This is what's actually happening. We're going to be arriving to our destination at this time. 
the FMC says this time and our schedule is this. So we can compare, you know, if it all makes sense and if it's all reasonable. If something would be noticed here, maybe, you know, a significant difference in fuel burn, for example, well, then the both pilots have to go in and start to investigate why that is. Is it due to a rerouting or maybe we have a fuel leak? And at this point, we have to investigate that. So this is what the pilot monitoring is doing, and that's happening continuously throughout the flight. Now, on top of that, pilot monitoring is also the one who's been talking to air traffic control. Um, the way that this works is that each air traffic control area is divided into a geographical area along our route. So if we're flying from, for example, Spain up to Scandinavia, well, then we'll be passing through many, many different air traffic control units. They generally... Uh, divided into countries and specific regions inside of these countries. And anytime that we move in between these regions, the air traffic control will hand over to the next. So we will speak to maybe, let's say, 15 different controllers on a flight like that. Okay. Uh, each one of these controllers is going to try to give us shortcuts, if possible, because the route is not a straight line from A to B. It's going to go between A, B, C, D, E, F, G, E, and so on. Um, this is because of the structure of the airspace, because of something called air uh, airways that we're following. But air traffic control is constantly monitoring and seeing how the traffic is evolving. And if there's a possibility to give us a shortcut, well, then they will do this. Okay? They will communicate that to the pilot monitoring. Pilot monitoring will read it back to air traffic control to make sure we have a closed loop communication so there's no misunderstandings. And then the pilot monitoring will take the direct routing, put it into the FMC. Pilot flying then checks without communicating with pilot monitoring that he or she has heard the same thing because we don't want any bias here to build up. And if pilot, mon uh, sorry, pilot flying agrees, uh, he or she will say execute pilot monitoring will execute the routing and then pilot flying checks that the aircraft continues to fly towards this new waypoint. And this happens continuously during the flight. So this is not just something that, that happens maybe once. It happens a lot of times during a long flight. Um, and this forms part of what, what pilot flying and pilot monitoring is constantly doing. Monitoring the aircraft, making sure that everything is happening the way it should. Obviously monitoring engine instrumentation so that nothing, no malfunction comes in. We're also having communication with our cabin crew that dings in and checks on us to make sure that we're still alive uh, on regular intervals. So there are definitely things to do. However, obviously, this does not fill a three-hour flight. So that brings us to point number two. What are we supposed to talk about? What can we talk about and what are we not allowed to talk about? So the thing to understand here, and this is something that I've talked about in previous podcasts as well, is that you have to have a little bit of social competence for, for this job to be enjoyable. Because you might be spending, for example, a three-hour flight up and a three-hour flight back together with someone in a space the size of a you know, medium-sized closet. And you have to have some kind of communication. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very boring. And this is, an, this is a, a question that I get very often. Do you ever get bored? And the answer to that is, yeah, yes, you do get bored. If you have a really long flight, if you're flying with someone that you might not have this, this great communication or chemistry with, well, then you can have, you know, 20 minutes of complete silence in the cockpit. And that's okay. Any, any job will be boring at one point or another. But the majority of flights and the majority of time, it's not boring. Okay? So what do we talk about then? Well, we can talk about anything, just like you would do with your colleagues in any job that you do. But there are specific things that we should avoid discussing, all right? And this is not something you will find in any flight manual written down, but it's something that we talk about during line training. And I guess you can kind of guess what those areas are. Hmm? Politics and religion, okay? Both of these areas are stuff that, that where you can find yourself having opposing views, okay? And also where you can feel very strong about it. The problem with that is that if you start discussing something like that, A, you might 
become antagonized. You, you might actually start to have a proper disagreement, which is something we always try to avoid in the cockpit. But also, even if you agree, it's likely that you're going to go into a very deep discussion. And when you do so, everything else disappears. You know that. If you've had a really good discussion with someone, you forget the world around you. And that cannot happen when you're in the flight deck. Because you need to continuously listen in the background to air traffic control when they're talking to other aircraft that might be close to you or indeed calling you on your call sign. So try to avoid these subjects because generally the discussions won't lead to something good and if it is a really good discussion it might still mean that you're missing a call from air traffic control, you might go out of radio range and you end up being intercepted by jet fighters which is not something you want. This is something I've done a separate video about. You can check out that video uh, when you've finished watching this one. Number three, are we allowed to read books, read newspapers, play computer games, watch uh, videos or movies or listen to music? Right, if you have listened to the first part of this video, you know that our major job as we're flying is making sure that the aircraft is safe and is behaving the way it should be. And this includes listening and talking to air traffic control. So that would kind of answer the question about whether we can listen to music or watch movies. Because if you do that, you are not going to be concentrating on what you're being paid to do. So using personal electronic devices, uh, listening to music is not allowed. Now I'm speaking for my airline here, of course, but I can kind of speak for all airlines on this. Now, there has been incidents where people have done this and gotten into some real trouble. Back in 2009, there was a very highly publicized article about an airline in the United States where two pilots um, forgot to descend into their destination. They ended up flying past the destination at the cruising altitude of 35,000 feet for 30 minutes after they were supposed to start descending. And the only reason that they you know, got into to contact with air traffic control again was because the cabin crew called them up and asked, well, aren't we supposed to land now? No. Okay. Found out during the investigation that these pilots had been taking up their laptops and they had been discussing new company policy when it came to rostering. And so this is kind of a combination of using personal electronic devices and talking politics. And they completely forgot where they were. For over 90 minutes, I think it was even more than that. They had no contact with air traffic control. For 30 minutes, so 10 minutes after they were supposed to land, they were still at their cruise level. So the investigation found that both pilots had been, um, had been doing stuff that they were not allowed to according to the company uh, manual, company uh, procedures. And I believe in the end, both pilots actually lost their license. So don't do this, guys. All right? I know it's really easy to fall into the habit of you know, doing something like this in a long flight. Maybe you have a stretch where no one says anything. You're flying out of the sea or whatever. But if you actually do this, you're breaking company policy and you are liable to it in case something happens. So refrain from doing it if you can. But what about reading books then? Uh, reading newspapers? Well, it's slightly different. Now, I would personally not start reading a book because I know that when I start reading a book, I get really into the book and I will have the same problems as if I was watching a movie. You might be different. Uh, newspapers is a bit of a gray area. Um, I'd say most, most pilots from one, you know, to another have probably read a newspaper. Um, it's better because it's just short stories, short articles. You're likely not getting kind of into the newspaper and you can still hold it up and monitor what's going on. So I would say that that would be kind of semi-okay, but it's going to be up to your airline to decide whether or not. I had an old, um, uh, an old instructor that used to tell me that, sure, use, an, use a newspaper if you want to, but don't log it as flight time, which kind of you know makes sense if you think about it. The fourth thing that I want to talk about is something I get questions about quite a lot. And that is, can pilots sleep while they're flying? What do you think? Well, the answer to that is actually yes. Obviously, this is depending on company procedure. Uh, the company have to have a specified procedure for how to do this, and it's called controlled rest. Some companies might have it, others might not. Uh, my company does have it, and it's a very, very controlled procedure where obviously 
both pilots have to agree on this. You can't just suddenly fall asleep. The other pilot has to feel fresh and uh, rested and take both radios and control. It has to be in cruise. Uh, it cannot be longer than 45 minutes of length because if you do, then you go into deep sleep, which is not good. And there also have to be time after the pilot who is taking the rest um, wakes up for about 20 minutes until he or she takes control of the aircraft because you get something called sleep inertia. You know how it feels when you're just woken up from a nap that you feel a bit disoriented and you cannot have that um, while you're flying. But this has been considered to be safer than having a pilot who might have been working a long day or flying a long flight early in the morning, slightly out of their circadian rhythm, when you have those kind of micro sleeps that's going on. Well, in that case, it's better to take a nap under controlled circumstances and get back kind of fresh and relaxed way before you're supposed to start descending into your destination. But like I said, when pilots do controlled rest, it's under very controlled circumstances. The, pilot, the cabin crew are supposed to be alerted to this so that they can check in and make sure um, that you know not the other pilot falls asleep or whatever um, but it happens during very controlled circumstances and it enhances flight safety quite a bit all right i've done a separate video if you want more information about the exact rules behind this you can check out that video later on so number five the last point is what about eating and drinking then well first of all is very very important guys if you're about to get into this profession especially if you're going into training that you remember to eat and drink and when drinking i mean drink water try to avoid drinking coffee all the time i have a problem with that myself i drink too much coffee but you have to continuously drink water throughout the day because it's really dry in the aircraft and you get you know dehydrated very quickly unless you continuously drink water when it comes to eating um my airline do very short turnarounds, only 25 minute long turnarounds, so there's no time on the ground to eat. This means that predominantly we'll be always eating in the cruise. And the way that we do this is that the one who wants to eat tend to hand over the controls and radio to the remaining pilot and just take 15-20 minutes. Take your hot meal that the cabin crew has prepared for you uh, and sit and watch the beautiful views. I can tell you that very few restaurants will ever rival the kind of views you have when you're sitting at 35,000 feet enjoying um, a nice hot cooked meal. So that's what we tend to do. The rumors that you've heard that pilots don't eat the same food, by the way, is true. Um, that has to do with, you know, taking down the risk of food poisoning. So they, the food has to come from two different sources, be of two different kinds. Um, and generally we tend not to eat at the same time both of us but it can be done in that case we just you know the one who has the least mouth uh, sorry the least food in the mouth will be answering the radio but generally we eat once at a time and uh, and that's it that's what i had about them um, about cruise and what pilot do in the cruise guys i hope you've enjoyed it and if you do enjoy these kind of videos make sure that you've left a like Write a comment if you like it, but definitely subscribe to the channel and hit the little notification bell so that you know when new videos are coming out, new material is coming out. I do live streams and things like that. You know, if you have the notification bell on, it means that you will be notified when I do live streams. So you can come in and ask your questions. I want to send a special thank you to the sponsor of this episode, which is brilliant.org. And when I tell you guys that you need to get your math and physics skills up, uh, I'm not lying. During your um, tests to get into flight school or to be accepted by an airline, you are going to have to do some basic mathematics testing okay and to keep that brain of yours sharp i would highly recommend you to use a tool like for example brilliant.org they have daily challenges that i think that you guys should be spending five minutes a day of using or they have a little bit more complicated stuff that you go in and you go through their courses and they will teach you things like arithmetics for example and uh, simple um, mathematical skills and how to solve fairly difficult problems. The 501st of you who uses this link here below will get a whopping 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant. So I highly recommend you go in and check out one of these challenges and see if you can go through the courses. There are some really, really good courses in there. 
Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are. And after this video, make sure that you come in and you visit me in the Mentor Aviation app. If you are a nervous flyer, for example, and you want to talk to some real experts, some psychologists or other nervous flyers, there's a forum for that. Or you can just go in, maybe you want to talk about flight training or why the aircraft sound like that or whatever it might be. There's either a forum or the active chat available. And I also have some really good... Um, 360 collections that you can get as well you know look around while i do things like engine failures rejected takeoff and emergency evacuations or um you know, stuff like that how to set up a 737 go in get the app completely for free to download and consider becoming a premium member if you want to support the app have a fantastic day and i'll see you next time Bye bye